Previously on Barefoot Boys, Mohan Bagan had found their footing, winning the 1905 Gladstone Cup, a first against a British team. But things in Bengal were taking a turn for the worse. April 1908. Magistrate Douglas Kingsford was playing bridge with his wife and the wife and daughter of his barrister and author friend Pringle Kennedy. At about 8.30 p.m. they played a final round and then they decided to call it a day. The Kennedys leave first in their horse-drawn carriage. The Kingsfords follow in their own carriage. Two young men have been scouting the location for a few days and are familiar with the route Kingsford's carriage would take. Upon routine questioning a few days earlier, they had said their names were Dinesh Chandra Roy and Horin Sharkar. From their strategically selected hideout, they see a carriage emerging from the driveway, as expected. They watch as the carriage slowly approaches the chosen spot, and they spring out of their hiding place and run towards it. The coachman sees them. He tries to stop the horse. Hey, hey, what do you want? What are you doing? But the bomb has been thrown. That was the attempted assassination of Magistrate Douglas Kingsford. Attempted because Magistrate Kingsford survived the attack. His bridge partners, Miss Grace Kennedy and her mother, didn't. The revolutionaries had thrown the bomb into the wrong carriage. Here's historian Peter Hees writing about the immediate aftermath of the explosion in his book, The Bomb in Bengal. The horse bolted. Miss Kennedy fell backwards and was dragged behind the carriage her long hair trailing in the dust. When the horse stopped, a man named Wilson ran up and extinguished the fire that was burning the upholstery and the lady's clothing. Then he had some men drag the carriage to Kingsford Bungalow, where he and the judge, who had reached home without realizing what had happened, carried the ladies into the house. Grace Kennedy died within the hour. Her mother, two days later, how had things come to this? Well, to find out, we need to take a few time jumps. We will first look at what the Indian National Congress was up to, from 1905 to 1907. Then we will jump a little further back and dig into the activities in an innocent-looking garden house in Manik Tola in 1902. And with our last jump, take a look at what this meant for the men in green and maroon. Some national history, some local history, and then, as always, some football history. From Luminary, this is Barefoot Boys, a podcast about an Indian football team that went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British and against all odds emerged as a national symbol. A symbol that told a country fighting for independence, we can win. I'm Konkona Sen Sharma. It is now 1906, one year after the partition of Bengal, two years before the attack. The Indian National Congress is in session in Calcutta, debating on whether to adopt Purna Swaraj, the Swadeshi and boycott movements, as national policies. But the moderate and extremist factions just couldn't see eye to eye. The extremists were led by Lala Lajpat Rai, Bal Gangadhar Tilak and Bipin Chandra Pal, called the Lal Bal Pal Triumvirate. They felt that the Indians had already spent a lot of time asking nicely and it hadn't really worked. And so, it was time for action. Bring on the strikes, agitation and boycotts. The moderate faction didn't believe in confrontational policies. They totally rejected violence as an option and that year, they were led by Dadabhai Nauroji. Who would prevail? As it turned out, neither side did. The resolutions passed by the INC in 1906 left both factions feeling burned. 
The moderates felt their ideals had been compromised by being forced to pass the Swadeshi boycott and national education proposals. But they had notched up a small victory by ensuring that a version of Swaraj was in their future and not total independence. All eyes were on Tilak and the extremist faction. What would they demand at the next Congress session? The signs were ominous because the host city announced for the 1907 Congress session was Nagpur. Deep in Tilak's home turf, Nagpur was known to be overtly and sometimes violently extremist. Fearing that they would lose even more influence in the Congress, the moderates had the session shifted from Nagpur to Surat, a moderate safe house, and they didn't inform the extremist faction of the change in venue. But that didn't deter Lal Bal Pal. They converged upon Surat accompanied by large numbers of supporters and that session in 1907 was, to put it mildly, chaotic. And things become really ugly and that really leads to the split because no more uh, there could be a reconciliation. The extremists working, the Tilak faction working within the Lal Bal Pal faction, uh, working within the, uh, the general umbrella of Congress, that was really not uh, possible anymore. And Rajbihari Ghosh, not Bose, mind you, he became the president. The moderates propped him as the president of the 1907 uh, 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 INC, of the 7th uh, Congress. And the Congress split. Now that the extremist faction had officially disassociated from the Congress, the British saw it as the perfect opportunity to clamp down on them. They arrested its top leaders and sent them to jail, all the while developing a relationship with the moderates. So this was the big picture at the time the bomb went off that quiet night in Muzaffarpur. It was a message from the extremists to both the British administration and their moderate allies. Indulge in talks and discussions all you want. Violent action is the only way to get the British to leave India alone. But who were these people? The second of our three stories will shed some light as we visit a garden house in Maniktala, circa 1902. It was an open secret that Calcutta had secret societies working to overthrow British rule. Some of them, by any means necessary. Of these societies or shomitis, the Onushilan Shomiti was the largest. Here's Professor Bhaduri again telling us about the origins of the organization. So in 1902, for the first time, Onushilan Shomiti, uh, a, a club which bears the name Onushilan Shomiti, uh, gets uh, established. And uh, so where lati practice and all that was done, uh, and uh, primarily, I mean, it would, uh, and there would be a very strong anti-Muslim subtext also, because the narratives that would be built up and inspired by Bunde Mataram, inspired by uh, Anandamot, inspired by a certain kind of nationalism, there was this continuous invocation of heroes from the like Shivaji and all. So the narrative would be channelized towards an anti-British idiom. The leaders of this Samiti were brothers. You've probably heard of at least one of them. Barin Ghosh and Aurobindo Ghosh. Aurobindo particularly was drawn to revolutionary ideas when he had met Tilak in the princely state of Baroda. After 1905, the anti-British sentiment generated by the partition boosted the popularity of the Onushilan Shomiti to a huge extent especially among educated, politically conscious youngsters throughout Bengal. And where would they assemble? At the Garden House, 36 Murari Pukur Road, Maniktala, Calcutta. Barin Ghosh's house. The Garden House was designed on the lines of an ashram, away from the public eye. A safe space for revolutionaries to live in strict discipline and prepare for its activities, assassinations and bombings. In 1907, Barin Ghosh sent an associate, Hem Chandra Kanungo, to Paris to learn the art of bomb-making from Nicholas Safransky, a Russian revolutionary in exile. Fully trained, Hem Kanungo returned to Bengal to plan another attack with Barin. Their target was Douglas Kingsford, the chief magistrate of the Presidency Court of Alipur. The first attempt to kill Kingsford was a book bomb that Hem Kanungo had constructed but Kingsford never opened it. The second attempt was also a failure, but two innocents were killed instead. It was carried out by two men going under the names Dinesh Chandra Roy and Harin Sharkar. Remember them from earlier? Their real names were Prafulla Chaki and Khudiram Bose. 
After throwing the bomb, Khudiram Bose and Profullo Chaki split and fled in different directions. Khudiram walked that whole night. Finally, the next morning, he reached Waini, a small town eight miles from the Samastipur train junction. Worn out, he entered a grocer's shop near the station to buy parched rice and water. But just then, two men approached him and started asking questions. One of the men was wearing boots. Guessing that they were cops, Khudiram tried to escape. But one of the constables tackled him, causing a revolver to fall from the bundle he was carrying. Khudiram drew his second revolver but was overpowered before he could fire. That afternoon, he was taken back to Muzaffarpur, where he made a statement as Harin Sharkar and took full responsibility for the attack. He regretted killing two Mame Sahibs instead of Kingsford but otherwise showed no repentance. At the trial in May 1908, he was found guilty and sentenced to execution by hanging. Upon his death, the Amrita Bazar Patrika wrote, He walked to the gallows firmly and cheerfully and even smiled when the cap was drawn over his head. He was 18 years old. Prafulla Chaki had slightly better luck, for a time. He had found a sympathiser in Trigunacharan Ghosh, a railway staffer who hid him in his home. In the night, Ghosh, perhaps using his railway connections, made arrangements for Chaki to board a train and escape Bengal. But on the train, Prafulla came under the suspicion of an off-duty policeman named Nandalal Banerjee. Banerjee tried to arrest him, but Prafulla Chaki shot himself. He was 19 years old. Meanwhile, at the garden house, Barin and the others knew that the police were closing in on them. Before the police moved in with their search warrants, the Samiti members managed to destroy whatever evidence they could find. They burned or buried it and even shifted locations in the night. When police eventually arrived, they could find very little to make a case. But they interrogated the young men, often harshly. This concerned Barin. He was worried that this would lead to a full-blown attack on the Samiti. He immediately went to the police and said he was solely responsible for the attacks. But his statement led to several arrests and ultimately to the Alipur bomb case, one of the longest and most complex trials in the history of British India. The ripple effect of the bombing and the trial was felt in many corners of the country over the next few years. The vernacular press was made even more toothless with the passing of the Indian Press Act of 1910. The Swadeshi and boycott movements all but petered out, with the top leaders behind bars and with the moderate faction of the INC working on a non-confrontational relationship with the Raj. It was a strange time, a terrible time, a time of much suffering, of hard choices and harsh consequences. Was this a history overdose? This period of Bengal's history is so rich and so distressing. But the real reason I went into this is to underscore the context of Mohan Bagan's golden run after the partition. And here's where we get into our third and final story. Sometime in 1907, Bagan was playing Dalhousie B in the Trades Cup. And the Dalhousie squad began to indiscriminately kick and shove the men in maroon and green. No provocation. They saw that they were losing the match and out of spite and their misplaced sense of superiority, they just turned the game into a street fight. But the spectators would have none of it. All their pent-up frustration and resentment against the British came boiling out. They rushed onto the field and the match devolved into a stadium-wide brawl. Sports historian Koushik Bandhupadhyay had told us about this earlier. Now, you can understand that in, in the context of this was happening in the context of the peak of the Shadeshi movement, uh, the revolutionary movement also began. And uh, in that kind of a situation, uh, spectator violence, spectator uh, hooliganism also became more prominent when the European teams or European spectators could not take uh, the sight of uh, Indian teams defeating uh, the European team. The British-dominated IFA tournament couldn't ignore Mohan Bagan's repeated successes on the field. They had won the Trades Cup three years in a row. Finally, they were invited to the biggest tournament in the country, the IFA Shield. Now a relatively more experienced and accomplished team, Bagan's inaugural season in the IFA Shield got off to an auspicious start. Their first opponents were the YMCA, whom they defeated with little effort, with a score of 1-0. But their next game was against the Gordon Highlanders 
and it didn't go very well. The outfield was slushy and wet, which was always bad news for barefooted players. The Gordon Highlanders ended up beating Bagan 3-0. But what really stands out about that match was what happened after. Other Indian clubs like Chinsura, Hair Sporting Club and Town Club were actually pleased about Bagan's loss. They printed mocking limericks on handbills and handed them around in the Moidan. Bamun hoye chaad dhorbe, ehi tar kamona re, ehi tar kamona. Mohun bagan shield nebe, ehi tar bashona re, ehi tar bashona. As if a dwarf can touch the moon, what a wish, oh what a wish. As if Mohun bagan can win the shield, what hope, oh what hope. Just like the warring factions of the Congress could not come together and agree on a unified strategy to challenge the British rule, there seems to have been a lack of unity among the Indian football clubs. Was it professional jealousy? Peak? Some murkier, malicious reason? Who knows? Things went even worse for Bagan the next year. In the 1910 edition of the IFA Shield, they bowed out in the very first round. But again, just like with the Indian national movement, these would be temporary setbacks. No force can indefinitely suppress a determined, proud people. 1911 was around the corner. A football match would be won and the British position in India would be further challenged. Mohan Bagan and its immortal 11 would be in the thick of it. Next, on The Barefoot Boys, we will meet more members of the Immortal Eleven and watch from the sidelines as they steadily make their way to the quarterfinals of the IFE Shield in 1911. Barefoot Boys is a luminary original podcast produced by Rainshine Entertainment and you've been listening to me, Konkona Sen Sharma. Gaurav Vaz is our executive producer, Vivek Madan is our director and script supervisor. Our writing team was led by Vivek Madan, Vikram Shah and Archana Nathan, who wrote these episodes along with Shankhudeep Sengupta, Nevin Thomas, Arka Bhattacharya and Amar Shiyas. We recorded the podcast at Island City Studios with Ashyar Balsara. Sachi Rajadhaksh is our sound designer and audio producer. And Ayan Dee mixed and mastered these episodes. Thanks to all our guests and experts for their time and valuable inputs. And a special thank you to Sidin Vadukut for his help getting this podcast off the ground. And most of all, thanks to the Omo Rakadosh, 11 men who did the impossible. Who taught a country to dream and for a brief moment showed us what freedom felt like long before we were free. <laughs>